Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, why do the wicked live on growing old and increasing in power, having children and grandchildren, homes that are safe and free from fear? And God doesn't do anything about it. He even allows them to prosper in their evil ways. They sing and they dance and they go to their graves in peace. And they say to God, we don't need you. Stay away from us. Why should we serve you? Why do we need to know your ways? And what good would come from praying to you anyway? These are the words of Job in Job chapter 21. Remember Job? Job who was very wealthy and very prosperous. And Satan came to God and said, the only reason Job worships you and praises you is because you've given him so many blessings. Take all of that away from him and he'll curse you. And God allowed Satan to take it all away from Job. All his wealth, his family, even allowing Job to experience sores and great discomfort. Job didn't curse God, but he sure struggled. And he struggled with God, and he struggled with why is it that it seems like the evil have life good, and the good often have life bad. That's Asaph's struggle, struggle as well in our psalm for today. Asaph was a uh, uh, sanctuary song leader, and God inspired him to write today's psalm that we're considering, Psalm 73. And it's a going through his struggles and, and moving from struggle and, and misunderstanding to moving to the joy of of understanding the blessings of the Lord. I invite you to take out the, um, in, or actually open up your service folder uh, to Psalm 73, because I'm going to walk through this psalm sort of verse by verse, point out some things, talk about it as we go through, because this is something that had, the people of God have struggled with from generation to generation. Why does it seem like the wicked prosper. Psalm 73 starts with, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. This is what Asaph is recognizing right off the bat. Those who have genuine faith and live a life and a relationship with God, God is, God is good to them. God has been good to Israel. But then he struggles with, but what about Israel's enemies? What about those people that are around them, that don't have a relationship with God and the way things are going with them? So then he says, verse 2, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. He's going to now talk about the struggle he had and how he almost slipped and, and fell away and went down a path that he didn't want to go. And what was the reason for that? He says in the next verse, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. His struggle was with envy. As he looked at how those who were not in a relationship with the Lord, how they were experiencing life, and the things that they were going through, and how they were prospering. And he envied that. And as he looked at that, he said, and from verses 4 all the way down to verse 12, he, he highlights to him what he sees, the positive things that they are experiencing. They have no struggles. They don't have any pain. They're free from burdens. They're able to live very prideful lives. They live in violence. They have absolutely no conscience whatsoever. They say and do whatever they want, and it doesn't even bother them. And they lay claim to heaven and the possessions of earth. They are prosperous, and they are happy. In verse 10, they have a lot of friends because people are coming to them and surrounding them. They're popular. 
They're the ones that people want to hang around with. And they treat God as a naive fool. As they say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? And he sums it up in the verse 12. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. He envies them. Envy is a sin. Envy is coveting. He looks out and he sees how well they're doing and he covets them. The problem with the sin of envy is that it leads to exaggeration. It leads to misperception. As he sees the wicked and thinks that life is so good for them. Now, certainly, there are those who are wicked who do have problems, who do suffer pain, who do have difficulties in life. But because of his, the sin of envy and how it is overwhelming him as he looks out at others, doesn't that happen to us sometimes? We'll look at other people or other circumstances and think, boy, the grass is so much greener over on that side of the fence. Boy, do they have it good. How come? Why do I have to go through this? And so in his envy, it's blinding to not be able to see the truth. And envy leads to doubt. Verse 13, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued, and I have been punished every morning. What's the point? Why do I work so hard at living a good life? They're not living a good life. They're doing whatever they want, and they're prospering, and life seems to be good for them. And I try, and I struggle, and I try to do the right thing, and I want to do the right thing. And all I get for it is punishment every morning. Life just doesn't go well. This is a downward spiral that Asaph is on because of his envy and his doubt. But then as we work through the psalm, his envy starts to turn to truth. Verse 16, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. He comes to the same conclusion that Job came to. Job struggled with this. People of God have struggled with this. And the answer that Job got is he wondered, why is it? Why is it that the evil seemed to prosper and, and the good, it doesn't seem like things go well for them? Why is that? And Job's answer that he received from God is, I'm God and you're not. We can't understand. And we do struggle with that. We don't comprehend. Why is it that sometimes those who don't have a relationship with God, it seems like they have things so well? And we all know people, Christians, wonderful followers of the Lord, who've had horrible tragedies in their life. Why does that happen? We don't understand. And God says, I'm God and you're not. It's beyond our grasp. But instead, we are to simply trust because he says, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. It was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. The sanctuary of God is a place where God reveals himself and reveals his ways. And for us as New Testament Christians, the sanctuary of God is where he reveals himself to us in his ways. And he reveals himself to us in his word. He reveals himself to us in the sacraments. And as we spend time in God's word, we are able to move beyond sin and move to truth. As 
we spend time reflecting on the the gift of baptism that the Lord has given us and making us his very own. The gift of the Lord's Supper when the Lord gives himself to us. That's how he reveals himself to us. And as he reveals himself to us, we come to understand the truth. And the truth is, what is the final destiny of the wicked, the final destiny of those who reject the Lord, who do not have a relationship with Him. Verse 18, Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. The things that seem to be to their advantage, that life just seems to go so well for them, is actually a danger, a slippery slope. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. God's judgment is swift. The judgment of God comes at the point of death for all. And those who lived in a relationship with the Lord here on this earth will continue to live in a relationship with the Lord for all eternity. And those who rejected the Lord and did not live in a relationship with Him on this earth the Lord will reject and there will not be a relationship with the Lord for all eternity. Now Jesus said in in his parable that there will be those who knock at the door and say, Lord, Lord, and he, he will respond, I don't know you. Those who rejected him on this earth. But it's important to note that Asaph is not saying here, just wait it out the wicked, they'll get it in the end. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's highlighting the truth, but the truth is also that God wants all people to be saved. God wants everyone to be in a relationship with him. He does not want anyone to, be, to reject him and to live forever without him. And he wants us to pray for those who don't have a relationship with him and to be concerned and to be saddened that they don't. But the truth is that there are those who do reject him. Asaph comes to a point of repentance. Verse 21, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. God, what an idiot I was, is what he's saying. That I doubted you, that I questioned you, that I lacked trust in you. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, as he confesses to the Lord. The wrong path he's gone down with his envy and his doubt. Verse 23, yes, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. Through all the doubt, through all the sin, through all the struggles that we go through, questions we have, things we don't understand, the incredible comfort is God holds on to us. He doesn't let go. Sinners as we are, doubters as we are, He doesn't let go. He holds on for us to journey with Him, to once again come to His sanctuary, to once again receive the truth, to once again grow in our faith and trust. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. As we, he comes to recognize, and as we come to recognize that God is with us, and blesses us, and forgives us, and strengthens us, and enables us to grow. But the thing that comes out here that is so important, that Asaph makes a point of, is that 
it's not about how blessed we are as we live here on this earth or aren't blessed. And it's not about, well, it might be tough while I live here on earth, but someday I'm going to be in heaven and it's going to be absolutely fabulous. I'm going to have all the blessings you can imagine. Yes, that's true. But the most important thing is not the blessings here on earth and not the blessings in heaven. The most important thing is the blesser. Our God. And His incredible love for us. And the fact that we have a relationship with Him because He loved us so much He sent His Son to die for us. To take upon Himself all of our sin and all the judgment that we deserve. And instead to receive His grace and to come into His glory. And we come into His glory not just in the future when we go to heaven. We come into His glory every time we confess our sins and He pours out His forgiveness upon us as we are washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. We come into His glory every time we are reminded of our baptism and that He's made us His very own. We come into His glory when we receive Him as body and His blood in the sacrament. We come into His glory and we, and we grow in His grace. The thing is, is it's not about the stuff and the blessings. It's about the blesser and the fact that we have a relationship with Him. As He says, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. God is our hope. He is the blesser. And we have a relationship with Him. No matter what we're going through. And then He comes to a confession at the end. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Again, not a, a gloating, not a looking forward to that. But also almost spoken in sadness. The sadness of those who reject will be rejected. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your mighty deeds. He's come full circle. He began in verse 1 about surely God is good to Israel. And he ends with, it is good for me to be near God. He has grown in his faith as he has struggled through his envy and his doubt and he has led to confession and he receives the glory of the forgiveness of God and the reminder of the relationship that he has with the eternal God. And how important it is for us uh, in that same process as we struggle, as, as the people of God have struggled through all generations. Why is it that it seems like people have it better than me? And why do I have to go through what I'm going through? We struggle with that. And how important this psalm is as it brings out the truth of the fact no matter what the struggle no matter what we go through he's holding on to us he's not going to let go and he enables us to be resilient and he enables us to grow in our faith and he enables us to grow in our trust and our confidence in him And he enables us to proclaim him. I will tell of your deeds. Why? Because there's people who don't have a relationship with him. Because there's people who don't know that joy. That even in the midst of trouble and hardship and difficulty, we can have hearts of joy because of the love of God, because of the blesser and our relationship with him. So we boldly proclaim that those who don't know that may come to know that truth. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. 
Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.